Hello everyone. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing today? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, if you can hear me, you can write in the chat box. We have a live chat box here on our YouTube channel. So I hope you got to revise for the CSET business communication subject. If you have any doubts or questions regarding whatever we've covered uh, so far on Saturday and Sunday, you can let me know. Okay. You can chat with me in the live chat box and I'll respond to you. So do you have any doubts or questions so far? Any doubts or questions? Do let me know in the chat box and I'll get back to you. Good evening, Prateeksha. Hi, Gopinath. Good evening. Do you have any doubts or questions so far? All oh, right, this is Sumati. Hi, good evening, Sumati. No doubt so far, right? Great. So what we do is we will continue with the rest of our work today. Okay, a very quick revision of the English part of it. And if you have, uh, if you have some time, maybe we'll work on a few MCQs. But let me remind you once again that for MCQs, please feel free to visit our website. If you want any more contact information, here it is. So you know that Excel Academy is your one-stop destination for company secretary course, right? So what you can do is just make a note of these contact numbers, contact details. Our WhatsApp number is 740-607-7406. And you can also email us at excelacademyonline at gmail.com. For more MCQs and for more details, you can always refer to our website. That's excelacademy.com. Okay, so let's start today with English grammar and its usage. So the first thing that we're going to begin with today is parts of speech in English. So do you have any doubts or questions here? I think you have already revised this yourself, but we'll just go over this in detail again. Uh, so what are the different kinds of parts of speech? What are the different parts of speech in English? Okay, so when we speak in English, right? What are the different parts of speech? In our sentence construction, what do we use? Very good. So Sumati says it's noun, pronoun, adjectives, adverbs. Okay, very good. So words are actually divided into eight classes according to the kind of work and function they have in a sentence. Right? So we have nouns, pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. So let's take a look at each of these in detail. So what are nouns? What do you mean by a noun? Feel free to write to me again in the chat box. Okay, so I'll keep asking you questions. If you have any questions, you can ask me as well. If you have any doubts, questions, answers, you want to say something, please use the chat box. Let me know. So what are the different kinds of nouns? What is a noun? What is its purpose? Okay. So, Sumati says it's a name. Pratiksha says that it's a name, place, animal, things. Very good. So, basically, a noun refers to any name, a place. It could be an animal. It could be a thing. Very good. Nouns are related to names and places. Okay. It basically names somebody or something. For example, if we say Rahul took the dog to, park, to the park, right? 
or the car makes a lot of noise. If you look at the first sentence here, the name of the person is Rahul, right? Like for example, my name is Madhuri. The name of the organization is Excel Academy, right? Your name is Sumati, for example. Your name is Patiksha, etc. Right? So all of these are nouns in terms of a name. Now we can also have an animal like I have a cat. You may have a dog. You may like cows, right? So we have names of animals as well. A place could refer to Bangalore, Delhi, Mysore, right? Paris. It could be also something like a park, a school. So this is what a place could be. A thing, for example, here the car makes a lot of noise. Thing here would be the car, right? I have a bottle of water. So the bottle of water is a thing. I have a telephone. Telephone is a thing. In this case, the car makes a lot of noise. We see that the word idea, right? So the idea here is noise. So noise is an idea, right? For example, I have an idea in my mind, right? So there is a thing in my mind. But I hear a lot of noise around me. Again, this is a concept. Yeah. So a noun basically means somebody or something. Now we have different kinds of nouns. So nouns are generally divided into common nouns and proper nouns. Right. And what do you mean by a common noun? What do you mean by a proper noun? What is a common noun? What is a proper noun? You could let me know again in the chat box, please. So a common noun is basically a common name that's given to all the persons, places or things of the same class. Right? For example, a bank, a school, a shop, a market. So if I say I'm going to school tomorrow, so we all know that it's a place where we're going to learn. Right? If I say I'm going to the market tomorrow, you know that I'm going to go and buy something. Right? Or if I sell something, I may sell it in the market as well. So that is a common noun. It's a common name given to all persons, places or things of the same class. The next kind of noun is proper noun. What is a proper noun? Okay, so Pradiksha says that a proper noun is particularly something that we point out. Okay, so for example, a person's name, the name of a country, right? The name of a company, the name of an organization, uh, the name of the day of the week, or the month of the year, for example. All of these are proper nouns. For example, you have India. Belgium, United States of America, Australia, right? All of these are names of countries. Then we have names of people, right? For example, we saw Rahul, then your names, your proper names, right? So those are uh, categories of proper nouns. Very good. So Pratiksha just added another point. That is, we start the word with a capital letter. That is generally how we recognize whether a noun is proper or not. Right. Again, common nouns are divided into two other categories. That is a collective noun. For example, a collective uh, noun refers to a group of people, animals, or things regarded as a whole. Right. For example, a flock of sheep. A lot of sheep together is a flock. Right. Then you have an army of soldiers. A lot of soldiers. Form an army. It's a collective noun. A fleet of ships. So you have a lot of boats and ships on the in the seas, right? A fleet or an armada would be a collection of them. And there is also something known as an abstract noun. So basically, this is an abstract concept. For example, it refers to things like feelings, right? You feel happy. You can feel sad. So happiness, sadness. These are ideas, concepts, feelings that one senses. All of these come under 
abstract nouns. The next category is a pronoun. So what exactly is a pronoun? Yeah, again, if you have any ideas, you can let me know in the chat box, please. What is a pronoun? Okay, very good. So it replaces the noun in some situations, right? Pronoun means it is a replacement for a noun. Instead of saying, Ram is a good boy. Ram is very intelligent. Ram goes to school. I can say Ram is a good boy. He is very intelligent. He goes to school. Right? Instead of keep keeping on repeating the same name Ram many times, you can say he instead. Right? So there are different categories of pronouns again. So you have personal pronouns and relative pronouns. So let's take a look at that. A personal pronoun generally represents a person or a thing. Right? For example, I. We, you, she, he, it, right? Him, them, all of this refers to a personal pronoun. A relative pronoun basically is a pronoun which relates to ideas or sentences together, for example. So it's like saying whom, which, that, right? This is the boy who saved my life, for example. So a relative pronoun generally acts as a pronoun and joins two sentences at the same time as the conjunction generally does, right? Then you have also another category called possessive pronouns. So these basically show possession, like mine. Instead of saying this is my bag, you can say this is mine. Ours, yours, their, its, hers, right? So we have different categories of pronouns. Okay, so I can see some examples that Sumati is giving. Ram is late. He has been coming late every day. Very good. Instead of keeping on repeating the same name, you're using a personal pronoun that is he. Very good. Good job. The next category of words, parts of speech, is an adjective. What exactly is an adjective? What's an adjective? Yeah, feel free to use the chat box, please. Very good. So an adjective is a describing word. It's a word used to describe a noun, right? For example, if you say Rani is a clever girl, what kind of a girl is Rani? She's clever. She's intelligent, right? He gave me six books. How many books did he give me? Did he give me five books? 10 books? No, he gave me six books. So numbers also could be adjectives in some cases. Then two or more words can be joined with a hyphen to form a compound adjective. For example, it is a government financed project. The government is financing the project, right? So it's a government financed project. Adjectives generally refer to uh, descriptions regarding nouns, like a tall boy, intelligent girl, right? Something like that. Then we have verbs. Verbs are very important in terms of communication. Why? What exactly is the function of a verb? What does a verb do? Why are verbs so important? Why do you think verbs are the most important words in a sentence? Yeah, think about it. Why do you think a verb is very important and why do you think it's considered to be the most important word in a sentence?
Okay, it conveys the actual meaning. Okay, any other ideas regarding verbs? It tells something about the person. Okay, very good. It basically talks about actions, right? A verb is something that talks about actions, right? Something that a person or thing is doing, for example. A verb is a doing word. It comes from the Latin word called verbal. This word is important. It may come in your CSET. Just make a note. The word verb comes from a Latin word called verbum, which means a word. And it's so called because it is the most important word in a sentence. Because it gives you an idea as to what that person is doing. It's a doing word. So let's see what a verb can tell us. A verb tells us what a person or thing does. For example, Rohit runs. The bell rings. It tells you the action that the person or the thing is doing. A verb can also tell you what is done to a thing or to a person. Ram is beaten. Somebody beat Ram, right? Maybe his parents, maybe his friends, maybe some strangers in the road. Ram is beaten. What happened to him is what the verb will tell you. The door is broken, right? Somebody broke the door. We don't know who, but now we see that the door is broken. So this is something that has been done to the person or a thing. It also talks about the state of being of a thing or a person. For example, the boy is hurt. How is that boy feeling? The boy is hurt. It's a state of being. The boy is hurt. The chair is broken. Again, it talks about the state of the chair. I feel sad. It talks about a state of me, right? My uh, mental state, for example. I feel sad. The next part of speech is an adverb. What exactly is an adverb? What is an adverb? So you know that an adjective describes a noun. So what exactly does an adverb do? Correct. So an adverb basically is an addition to a verb, right? So an adverb modifies the meanings of not only words, but of adjectives, prepositions, conjunctions, other adverbs also, right? So yes, so basically it helps in modifying. So let's take a look at certain sentences to help figure out better, right? So small investors find it very difficult to invest wisely. So in this sentence, small investors find it very difficult to invest wisely. Let's take a look. The first adverb, very, modifies the adjective called difficult. How difficult is it? It's very difficult. And the second adverb, wisely, modifies the first verb that is invest. Right? Wisely is modifying the word invest. How are you going to invest it? I'm going to invest it wisely. How do I find it? I find it very difficult, right? So we see that the adverbs very and wisely modify adjectives as well as verbs. Okay, so the next one is the CEO is an exceptionally sharp manager. What kind of a CEO is he? Exceptionally sharp, right? So the adverb exceptionally modifies the word sharp, which is an adjective. The next is that the cash counter is right behind you. The cash counter is right behind you. So here, the adverb right modifies the preposition behind. Where is the cash counter? Right behind you. You know, it's absolutely behind you. Another one, we have given this book to you only because you are a good reviewer. So the adverb only modifies the conjunction because. Now that we spoke a little bit about the preposition, for example, behind, 
What exactly is a preposition now? What is a preposition? Yeah, you could write out your answers, please, in the uh, live chat here. What is the preposition? So a preposition basically by definition is placed before a noun or its equivalent in order to show its relationship in terms of time or place. Generally, a preposition marks a location or in terms of space, it helps you locate you or in terms of time, right? To talk about this, let's use certain examples. Let's see what the examples say. Yeah, so it's about time related things. It could also be place related things, Sumati. So let's take a look here. The space above the room houses the conference facility. So the place above the room. It explains the relationship between the room and the conference facility. Where is the conference facility located? Above the room, right? So let's take a look at some other prepositions. About, for example, move a spread across the understood ahead is like make progress, right? Sometimes in colloquial usage, prepositions are, um, you know, sometimes used wrongly. Okay. And that's why you have to be very careful when you learn the correct usage of prepositions. So take a look at the dictionary for, you know, a list of prepositions and how to use them correctly, right? Because if you use a wrong preposition in a situation, it would just modify the entire meaning and you may not, the person that you're trying to communicate with may not understand exactly what it is that you're trying to convey. Okay, so one has to be very, very careful in terms of using prepositions. The next part that we're going to come to now is a conjunction. So what exactly is a conjunction? So conjunctions can be words or even sentences which convey related ideas. So two of the most commonly used conjunctions are and and but. Okay, for example, Ram and Gopal are brothers. So one person and the other person are brothers. Okay, for example, I can see you, but I can't hear you. So I can do one thing, but I can't do the other thing, right? For example, we received your letter and telegram, but regret our inability to attend the meeting. We have got this and this, but we cannot do something else. Right? This is exactly what it means. So conjunctions may also be used in pairs. For example, neither nor, either or, not only, but also, both and, whether, etc. Right? So we have to be, again, very careful in terms of using conjunction and in terms of choosing the right conjunction in the appropriate sentence. Now let's take a look at the last part of speech that is known as an interjection. What do you mean by an interjection? What's an interjection? So basically interjections are words which are used in a sentence to express strong feelings or emotions. Okay, they may not form a part of its grammatical structure. For example, just a hi, 
you know, instead of saying hello, good evening, you know, you just say hi. It's with a lot of enthusiasm. It's with a lot of feeling, right? Or if I don't understand something, I say, oh, okay, oh, you know, maybe I didn't understand it. Oh, or it could be a surprise as well, right? Like, oh, wow, you know, it could be a surprise. Um, it could also be to express um, shock, surprise, uh, even sometimes sadness, right? Like you say, alas, the king is dead, right? It, you're very sad about it. It's just basically short words which help express a very strong feeling or emotion. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to come to is the type of voices. There are two kinds of voices generally used in English. That's the active voice and the passive voice. So active voice sentences are generally shorter and direct, empathetic. Okay, for example, please place the order within 60 days of the receipt of the quotation. Okay, but passive voice is also found in English language, right? But it's generally used while drafting legal formulations as no identifiable subject can be mentioned. For example, follow the traffic rules while driving. That is an active voice. Passive rules, a passive voice is the traffic rules should be followed while driving. Okay. For example, active voice. I made a cake this evening. Okay. I baked a cake this evening. But a passive voice would say, a cake was baked by me, right? So generally, active voice sentences are much shorter, direct, and passive voice sentences are generally used while drafting, uh, you know, legal formulations when the subject cannot be identified generally, okay? So be careful of the kind of voice you use in English. The next part that we're going to come to is an article. What's an article? Where is it used? What's an article? Yeah, you could type it in the chat box again. So they're basically words which are used before nouns, right? Generally, good. So they can be a, an, or the. Good job. They come, they are placed before nouns and a or an are known as indefinite articles because it usually leaves indefinite the person or thing spoken of, right? For example, a doctor means any doctor. A student means any student, right? And the is called the definite article because it normally points out something that is particular, that is specific. For example, he saw the doctor coming, which means that he saw one particular doctor coming in. An indefinite article can be used before singular countable nouns. For example, a car, an apple, a table. And the definite article is used before singular countable nouns. Plural countable nouns and also uncountable nouns. For example, the pen. The pens, plural. The milk, the idea. So milk, an idea can be uncountable as well, right? Like some milk, some idea. Can you count an idea? No, but it's the idea. It could be an idea as well, right? It depends again on the kind of uh, sentence you're trying to construct. The next article is an. So generally, an is used with a noun, uh, you know, when it begins with a vowel sound, like A, E, I, O, U. For example, bring me an apple. We can't say bring me a apple because a apple starts with a vowel and we hear a vowel sound. So bring me an apple is the correct usage. He walks 
like an Egyptian, and she has planted a eucalyptus tree. Okay, because there is no real vowel sound there. He is an honest man. You don't say honest, right? You don't say the word. You don't pronounce the word H. So it's pronounced as O. Honest. And we hear a vowel sound. That is why you use. He is an honest man. He has joined a union. I have lost a one rupee note. Okay. So the next part that we're going to move on is uh, two tenses, right? So what is a tense? What do you mean by a tense? And what are the three kinds of tenses that we have in English? No. So here for European, he met a European person, right? It won't be an. Because it sounds like a U, right? It doesn't sound like in uh, like E or I, for example. That's why. Okay. I hope Abhishek have answered your question there. Uh, tenses. So what are the different kind of tenses? Yes. So Preeti, Pratiksha and Sumati tell me that we have past, present and future tenses. Okay. Yeah, correct. Very good. So... Uh, the word tense comes from a Latin word called tempus, which means time. So now let's read the following sentences. I write this letter to my mother. I wrote the letter yesterday. I shall write another letter tomorrow. In sentence one, the verb write refers to present time. Hence, a verb that refers to present time is said to be in the present tense. In sentence two, I wrote the letter yesterday. The word wrote refers to past time. This is why the sentence is said to be in the past tense. In the third sentence, I shall write a letter tomorrow. Okay, The word shall write refers to a future time. That's why it's called the future tense. Now, let's take a look at the different categories of present tenses. I read a book. Sorry, I read a book. I read a book is the simple present. I am reading a book is the present continuous because I read a book in general, but I am reading a book right now. It's an action that I'm doing right now. So it's the present continuous. I have read a book is the present perfect. And I have been reading a book means it's the present perfect continuous. Okay, so wherever you see have, or have been, that would be the present perfect and the present perfect continuous. Similarly, we can see this in all the tenses, right? So even the past tense has four forms. For example, I jumped from the window. That's the simple past tense. I was jumping from the window. That's the past continuous. I had jumped from the window is the past perfect. And I had been jumping is the past present continuous. So all you have to do in tenses is just pay attention to what is being conveyed. Whether the action is complete in general, is continuing, or happened in the past, or will happen in the future. Right? Similarly, the future tense also has the following four forms. I shall, will jump. That's the simple future. I shall will be jumping as the future continuous. I shall will have jumped is the future perfect. And I shall will have been jumping is the future perfect continuous tense. So wherever we talk about the tense, it generally shows us time and a state of action or an event. Okay. So the next uh, part that is very important basically is uh, this. Just a second. Is prefixes and suffixes. So what exactly is a prefix and what is a suffix? This is uh, so I'm covering the very important parts, right? So what is a prefix and what is a suffix? What do you mean by prefix? 
What is the suffix? Yeah, pre is before. So basically, a prefix is an addition that comes at the beginning of a word, right? That's a prefix. And a suffix generally comes at the end. Now we have different kinds of prefixes and suffixes, right? So let's take a look at a few of them. Uh, for example, if you have a word like choice, you can have a prefix before that, like pro-choice, pro-market, pro-life. It could be also in terms of opposing factors, right? For example, anti is against antibody, antibacterial, which is against bacteria. Antibiotic is against anything that's living, right? Antibiotic. Anti-clockwise. Clockwise is in one direction. Anti-clockwise is in the other direction. Antidote, anti-inflammatory, right? Antioxidant. For example, the word contra, contra means against, like uh, contraception, contraindicate, contravene, right? You can also have contrasting, like contraflow, contraactive, contradict, contradistinction, right? So for prefixes and suffixes, it would be best to go through this list and try to analyze each word, okay? So this will also help you improve your vocabulary. For example, again, let's take a look at a few of the negative prefixes. A is like saying not or without, right? Like a moral, a historical, atheist, asymmetrical. And is again not or lacking, like anesthetic, anemic, anaerobic. This is not like disloyal, disabled, disarm, dishonest, distrust, disadvantage. In is like not, right? Again, like injustice, inactive, inconsiderate, inconsonant, incomprehensible, incomplete, incompetent, etc. Similarly, you have IL, like illegal, illiterate, illegible. Then you have IN, like imbalance, immaterial, immobile, immovable, impatient, impossible, etc. Then you have IR, like irreplaceable, irregular, irrecoverable. And then you have non, which again means not, like non-aggressive, non-stop, non-entity, nonsense, non-toxic. Sometimes you also see un, right? Like unproductive, unacademic, unselfish, unavoidable, unaware, unbroken. Sometimes we also come across reversative prefixes. Basically, these are prefixes that denote the act of undoing the previous act that the root word denotes as being done. For example, criminalize, the opposite is decriminalize, right? Select, deselect, contaminate, decontaminate. This again reverses the meaning. For example, qualify, disqualify, honest, dishonest. Un like to tie up something and to untie something. Scramble, unscramble. Lock, unlock. Okay. Again, we see that there are derivative prefixes. For example, D here means to remove something. Debug, defrost. D could also be to depart from. Like deplane, detrain, decamp. This is to remove something. Un is also to remove something like this arm, this illusion, unleaded, unmark, uncap, uncover, right? So we have a lot of these words. So we have to just keep going through them, try to figure it out and use them in context. This will also help you build your vocabulary and your sentence construction. There are some other pejorative prefixes. For example, miss like miscalculate, misspell, mismanage, misbelief, right? And then you have place prefixes, which indicate the place of things in situations. Like ante is before, antecedent, antechamber, anteroom. 
circum is around circum went circum navigate circum lotion okay Lo uh, locution sorry then you have cis like on this side cis alpine cis lunar etc you have extra which is uh, outside or beyond like extracurricular extra sensory extraordinary extra terrestrial four which is in front generally or before like the forehead right the four front four finger four cord four arm etc you have in il in ir right like indoors in patient then you have interbred interfere interject introvert introspect for example with intro intra you have intravenous intranet so try to think of these words how you will see them in context and how to use them then uh let's take a look at post right post means after or behind like to postpone a post graduate a post doctorate post meridian okay pre is before like pre arrange pre phase precaution preamble so past is to outrun for example right so out outdoor outpatient outhouse or outrun to surpass something out distance out bid out number over is like outer or above over through over shadow over coat for instance so we see a lot of other categories as well like retro that is backwards retrograde retrospection retrospect sub is below generally subway is a uh, you know pathway underground right like a subway subconscious submerge secondary okay it could also be like sub inspector sub editor somebody who's just below subtitle it could also mean something that is below the norm like sub standard sub human it's not up to the standard not up to the mark it's below that sub standard right super could be above beyond the norm or excessive like super structure super impose super human super star super power super confident super natural super sensitive right so you have different kinds of suffixes like that uh, sorry prefixes like that so go over this list this will definitely help sometimes we have also size prefixes like mega midi midi right mega is very large like a mega phone a mega star somebody who's a huge star midi is something that is medium like a midi bus a midi computer a medium sized one mini is small like a mini bus or tiny bus mini cab mini market mini series that we see sometimes on netflix and prime they have just two three four episodes right mini series then you have also time based prefixes like ante is before ex is former ex president ex student ex wife okay so you have neo which is new or recent neo conservative post is after post war post modernism etc okay so um there are a couple of questions here how can prefixes be asked in cset can you give an example of how the questions can come okay so maybe they'll ask you for example uh let's take a word okay so maybe we can take a word like this right uh select okay the word is select what could be the opposite of it they may give you four options you'll have to choose the correct one would it be deselect would it be something else right honest what could be the opposite maybe or if you add a prefix to it the word honest changes it makes it the opposite so which prefix will you use this or uh, maybe miss un or uh, anti right maybe they'll give you a list of prefixes and you'll have to choose the correct one so it could be in any different way all you have to do is remember these words because it's all part of vocabulary right so try thinking of it that way it will definitely help 
they may ask you to choose a correct prefix for example they may give you the meaning of a word like this person is a huge star so what word will you use will you use mini will you use four will you use neo or will you use mega for example you will use mega star right this person is a huge star it's a mega star so it could be that way pratiksha okay then sometimes prefixes also help fix a number like mono means one mono rail monopoly monochrome uni is also one unilateral unity unidirectional okay bi could be twice or double like bicycle bilingual you know somebody who speaks two languages so my suggestion is really to go through this list of vocabulary because it's very rich in terms of vocabulary they may ask you also how many languages do you think a bilingual person speaks right 1 2 3 4 so the answer is two because it says bi it means two right so try and remember these words in context like that it would also be good if you could try to anticipate questions okay so this um, you know helps you with your analytical skills your um, anticipatory skills as well you're able to try and figure out you know what possible questions could come so give this a shot try and think about it this way as well yeah yes see you already got the answer pratiksha so try and think of it this way and figure it out it will definitely help right especially words like this by di duo tri right quadri tetra penta right all of this octo deca demi hemi right all of this will help and then you have like a list of uh, miscellaneous prefixes etc just go through this entire list that will help a lot we will now move on to the suffix part of the lesson what is a suffix we did a prefix which comes before a word what exactly is a suffix now yeah what's a suffix think about it Okay, great. Pratiksha says that suffix is something that comes at the end, right? So let's figure this out, right? So you have noun suffixes, adjective suffixes, verb suffixes, and adverb suffixes. So let's take a look at what all of these are, right? Noun suffixes, for example, are as follows. So you have acity, which indicates a quality or a state of being. for example audacity capacity okay int generally denotes attribution of an action or state like an appellant informant arrogant a deodorant oxidant all refers to a verb action for example betrayal dismissal deferral okay then age or age refers to denoting an action or its result function state etc leverage homage bondage baggage postage mileage etc then we have asio sio like collaboration uh, collaboration exploration or uh, evolution inhalation communion oblivion objection etc okay then c l e q l u generally refers to something that is tiny like a small size like minuscule particle molecule okay mechanic okay all of these are very small things then you have ist that is a member of a profession right for example a dentist a novelist a pianist an atheist uh then you have it for example like responsibility technicality humility etc link is something that is small again like a duckling a seedling okay met means or results of an uh, it means like it's the means or result of an action 
for example an arrangement embarrassment bewilderment ness could be a condition or a state usefulness willingness kindness happiness right then you have ship which uh, you know denotes the quality or condition status tenure or skill for example scholarship companionship citizenship workmanship membership tude indicates the condition of or the state of being actually it's like saying exactitude longitude etc then you also have verb suffixes for example if you put fi or if you before or uh, sorry after a word like beauty beautify purify gratify electrify pacify personify it means that it indicates a becoming i is generally refers to a quality or state or function of something like capitalize modernize popularize terrorize expertise right then you have adjective suffixes as well some of them are as follows like able or able inclined to capable of causing audible unaccountable right readable reliable terrible peace uh, peaceable profitable then you again have ail and al which is kind of like tidal musical ed is like having or affected by cultured heavy handed talented then you have full having the qualities of like sorrowful powerful careful forgetful ik like arabic aristocratic dramatic less is free from or without like careless harmless restless flavorless oid means something which resembles like ovioid humanoid some is like a tendency like meddlesome awesome e means having quality of inclined to messy funny sleepy choosy right and the last kind of suffix that we can see generally is an adverb suffix if you add ly it's to help you form adverbs from adjectives like candid candidly surprising surprisingly great greatly okay wise could be of a manner or respect a direction for example clockwise the manner in which the clock moves right clockwise you have anti clockwise note wise tax wise etc sometimes you have a combination of words that are used right most of these words come from latin or greek origins for example art is a chief like an arch bishop arch rival right then you have auto which means self like autograph autopilot bio is life like biodiversity biology biography then you have crypto which is concealed like crypto forest cryptogram crypto crystalline mal that is improper inadequate okay or something that is faulty like mal nutrition mal practice mal adjusted mal function mal treat macro is something that is large you must have come across this in macro economics macro organism micro is the opposite which means that something small right like a micro organism a micro computer microgram microscope micro surgery mid like middle midway mid section mid afternoon mid winter midnight then you have tel which means at a distance like telescope television telephone telephoto telecommunication the next part of the essentials of good english is punctuations what are the different kinds of punctuations that are used in the uh, in the english language and why is punctuation used what are the different kinds and why are punctuation marks used 
Yeah, you could write in your answers in the live chat box here and the on the YouTube side. You can use that. So the marks such as full stop, comma, inverted commas, hyphen brackets are generally used to separate sentences and their elements and to clarify meanings, right? These are called punctuation marks. They're used because of the importance of pause, intonation, emphasis used in the spoken word. You know, uh, also punctuation marks, their chief purpose is to make the meaning of a sentence or a passage very clear and they help in removing ambiguities if any right for example they help you introduce delicate effects and style it helps you alter the flow of a sentence it helps in highlighting certain words it brings about modulations in sentences so let's take a look at some of the most important uh, you know punctuation marks like you have capital letters you have a full stop, hyphen, asterisk, a paragraph. There are brackets. There are different kinds of brackets again. You have a colon. You have a dash. You have stroke, ellipsis, comma, exclamation mark, underline, quotation marks, bold emphasis. We use question marks when we ask questions, abbreviations, space, italics, apostrophe, semicolon, and numbers. Right? So what I would suggest is go through the punctuation marks in details. But... Let me ask you a few questions. You could just type in your answers, right? Why do we use a full stop? Okay, you could type in your answer here. You already use full stops in sentences. So I'm not going to explain why, but I'm going to ask you. So you can tell me why. So why does one use a full stop? Yeah, to complete a sentence. Okay, at the end of a sentence, when you put a full stop, we know that the sentence is ended. Okay, a full stop can also be used. Yes, very good, Soha. It's also called a period. Okay, very good. Sometimes a full stop is also used after initials or in an abbreviation, right? For example, MR stands for Mr. So it's MR dot generally, right? Here, for Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, we write APJ because those are his initials. But increasingly, the full stops after initials of names is being done away with, although you can do it with or without, right? Even if you don't put a full stop, it's fine, but if you do, it's okay too. So let me ask you another question What is a comma used for? What is a comma used for? Yeah, why is a comma used? Yeah, it's used to continue a sentence. Very good. So it means that the sentence is not ended. Maybe there is just a short pause, right? So commas generally separate or enclose subordinate clauses and the phrases in a sentence. So it basically separates main clauses, right? For example, the higher the price, the better the quality of goods. Right? Then we'll see uh, different parts, right? For example, here, the uh, before tags or questions or comments, you were late for the meeting, weren't you? It's a tag, right? I was just joking, you see. To denote words that were left out. Okay? Like Romeo loved Juliet, Majnu, comma, Lela, right? Here, the comma denotes the word loved. So there are various reasons, but generally it's for a little pause. Why is a hyphen used between words? Why is a hyphen used between words?
Yeah. So a hyphen is used between words generally to clarify meaning. It also links words to form a compound word. Right. For example, we have ex-partner, half-truth, semi-government, self-appointed. Yeah. For example, neo-Darwinism, neo-Nazism, anti-Indian, for example. So we see that, right? Then uh, I'm just going to move on to the more important ones. What's, uh, what is a question mark used for? What is a question mark used for? Why do we use a question mark? For a question, right? So that's very good. So here is a summary of the punctuations, right? Let's go through some of them. So that's full stop, comma, hyphen, semicolon, colon, apostrophe, quotation marks. There are different kinds of brackets, okay? So you have square brackets, crescent brackets, brace brackets, and angle brackets. Go through this again. Now let's work on a few sample questions, right? So choose the correct options for the four choices here. Give an example pertinent dash the case. Would it be with, on, for, or to? Choose the correct option out of the four choices here. Give an example pertinent dash the case. With on for two. Two. Yes. So all of this, right? All of these aspects of English comes with practice. For example, where we learned about business communication, listening skills, email, business correspondence the other day. Those, you can go through these notes, right? Um, in the uh, CSET book booklet for business communication, go through that. You can score a lot of marks there, right? For English, for the English section, try doing as much as you can. But for English, all that will really help is a lot of practice, okay? So keep practicing. You'll find a lot of MCQs on our website as well. Practice there. Apart from that, I would suggest, uh, you know, going online, checking uh, different workbooks, uh, different websites where you can actually practice English. Keep practicing every day. That will only help. Okay. The next one is the reward was not commensurate dash the work done by us. For, on, with or order. So in answer one, the word two is correct. In question two, what is it? The reward was not commensurate dash the work done by us. For, on, with or order. With? With? Very good. The next one, supposedly digital voice discs or DVDs as they are called are dash resistant to scratching dash records, much than so as, such as, such than, sorry, and uh, far more than. In cases like this, try fitting in the answer and see what sounds better. Sometimes, you know, even the sound of it, if it sounds correct, it generally is. So what could your answer be here for number three? Supposedly, digital voice discs or DVDs, as they are called, are dash resistant to scratching dash records. Yeah, far more than. Very good. Far more in this blank and than in this. Good job. The fourth one now. English is today the third dash native language worldwide after Chinese and Hindi with some 830 million speakers. The most spoken, the more spoken, most spoken or the least spoken. Yeah. 
Now be very careful. Option A and C look the same. The most spoken and most spoken. Right? So you have to be very careful here. Correct. It's most spoken because you can't use the here. Right? Because I've already said the third. So observe your questions very carefully as well in terms of MCQs. Number five, no clinical studies dash in this child disease research so far. Had completed, have been completed, have completed, had to complete. Yeah, have been completed. Very good. Have been completed is the right option. Number six now. I don't know why she didn't ask me how to do it as I dash her. Must have helped, could have helped, might help, should have helped. What do you think is correct? Yep, yeah, could have helped. Very good. The seventh one, we all think that Maria Dash an interesting person to meet as we dash a lot of stories about her so far. Is, had heard, can be heard, might have been here or would be, have heard. What do you think is correct? Yeah, you could type in your answer. We all think that Maria. So in questions like this, try putting the answers in the relevant blanks, right? Try inserting the answers in the relevant blank. Say it out loud once in your mind, maybe. And then try and figure out the correct answer. So I see that you've marked would be, have heard. That's very good. The eighth one. Mike has been told he will have to pay the fine dash his high rank in the military, even if furthermore on grounds that or despite. Right? So the answer is despite. Okay. In the next one, Good job. Yes, it's despite. Correct. In the ninth one, in the following sentence, a part of the sentence may have an error. Find out which part of the sentence was, you know, had an error. Right? We got caught in the pouring rain without either raincoats nor an umbrella. No error. So is it the first one, second one, third or the fourth? Which is the mistake? Can you say either non or is it neither nor or either or right so basic things like this you have to really keep in mind that's why it's this part right without either raincoats nor umbrella right so it's non correct that's why okay be careful there the next part is enriching vocabulary so why do you think vocabulary is very important why is vocabulary important? Why is having good vocabulary very important? Yeah, you could type in your answers. Personally, why do you find vocabulary, enriching vocabulary, an important aspect of the English language? Yeah, because words help you explain, right? A language is related to words. Yeah, so good vocabulary helps, um, like Pratiksha says, it helps gain confidence in both speaking and writing. The receiver can understand, very good. The sender can also come up with a better message, right? With better words, 
shorter words maybe crisper words the meaning can become concise clear you remember all the c uh, six uh, seven c's that we did for communication and then how to write good business correspondence how to write the, a good letter a good message etc it will definitely help in that okay so good english is a must for good business communication all right so now let's come to some of the vocabulary topics here we're going to cover choice of words synonyms antonyms homonyms homophones one word substitution words that are frequently misspelled idioms and phrases proverbs foreign words and phrases that are commonly used and abbreviations okay we won't do everything in detail i would like to invite you to go through this um, you know the cset material afterwards but this is just a quick revision for you to help brush up everything that you have already learned about okay but i'll try and cover as much as i can so the next thing is a choice of words right so how do you choose a right word what does it depend on what does your choice of words depend on the first thing is it depends on the range of your vocabulary right unless you know a word you can't use it so the way to help improve that is by reading more is by listening more effectively actively right then the other um you know factor which is important when you're communicating someone is to figure out the audience of the person that you're communicating with if you're speaking to a child you can't use big fancy business words because a child will not understand right similarly if you're going to uh, you know uh, talk in a business meeting it has to be formal vocabulary you cannot use informal slang vocabulary right so language has to be appropriate to the audience then it depends on the kind of communication uh, you know it is about for example is it formal informal is it oral or written all of this will matter in your choice of words okay good so i can see that you have given very uh, you know useful inputs like one should be careful one should use proper grammar as well yes but one should also use proper words not just the grammar aspect of it but also the vocabulary aspect of it then you have to also see the kind of message that you intend to convey is it urgent is it accurate right all of this will again influence your choice of words the context and usage is very important okay certain words can only be used in a particular concept in a particular context sorry if they are used otherwise in a different context they could convey a wrong sense okay that's why context and usage matters a lot as well again regional national differences in languages and connotations also influence your choice of words all right and then how does one improve vocabulary by trying to understand the root or the etymology of the words good dictionaries give all the changes that a root word can undergo so my recommendation is to invest in a very good dictionary or use uh, you know any online dictionary that you have and keep looking at new words that you come across look at the sentences that they use with it right what kind of sentences what kind of context is a certain word used in try doing the same try practicing this will definitely help improve your vocabulary and read more listen more actively for that a very important strategy is to be very adaptive right adaptation is the best strategy for effective wording then how do you choose the right word so some of the tips and tricks is to be very simple in your language right simplicity is very important then try to use familiar words so that the other person can also understand the next thing is avoid using superfluous words or verbosity it's basically trying to use a lot more words than are actually necessary 
choose shorter words it makes your um you know uh, what do you say your communication much more clear it's easier to retain as well on the part of the receiver select words for precise meaning this will happen when your vocabulary is good okay so select words for the exact meaning for the precise meaning and uh, these days it's very important that we try to use gender neutral words in our business space okay the next thing is a synonym so what exactly is a synonym what's a synonym so the next aspect of enriching vocabulary is a synonym what synonym correct same words or words which have similar meanings right same meanings or similar meanings for example easy simple light effortless facile and smooth or effort exertion pains trouble the third category is elastic flexible supple springy resilient right they are all synonyms so let's take a look at some of the most common ones for example adept means proficient or somebody who is skilled at something abstain is to refrain to withhold a bridge is to shorten or curtail abundant is plentiful ample copious accessory is additional auxiliary achieve means accomplish execute or gain adept is somebody again who is proficient or skilled it's a repetition here you could strike it off from your book Uh, adequate is sufficient or satisfactory adherent is a follower or a disciple right admiration refers to praise approbation brisk is something that is quick fast agile lively right callous is hard unsympathetic cordial for example is gracious congenial so let's take a look at the uh, most commonly used ones actually okay so you have deteriorate that is to decline or to degenerate right then you have um dexterity which refers to skill or deftness didactic is something that is preachy or moralizing fabricate is to concoct to contrive okay gigantic is colossal or huge hazardous is something that is dangerous or risky malice is like ill will or spite morbid is morose sickly negligent is careless or lax right and obtuse is dull stupid blunt reticent is somebody who is silent or reserved right sterile is barren infertile or vain is cosmopolitan so cultured okay wholesome is healthy sound healing yearn is to crave or pine for something zenith is the summit or the culmination okay so go through these lists again go through these words i would definitely recommend using the thesaurus or a dictionary to uh, you know take a look at synonyms you'll get a lot more words as compared to this it will eventually help you build your um english grammar skills and uh, your vocabulary skills right so keep practicing i mean that is my only suggestion with more practice you get better and don't practice just for an exam right because you have you know once you clear your cset you'll have your cs course to do then you'll have the workplace to live in, to work in right in your daily lives as well so don't stop by preparing just for an exam keep pushing yourself so that you study more so that you keep practicing right for life not just for a particular exam okay so now let's move on to the next part which is antonyms yes exactly so sumati has a very relevant point here in the mock test they are asking for more words which are not in the books exactly because english language it's a language right you can't contain it in a small book in the in this little booklet or book 
you can't have all the words there they'll ask you words for the english uh, grammar and uh, sorry for the english grammar and vocabulary part from outside obviously it's not possible to you know download the entire dictionary in your head it's just not possible so what i would suggest is practice little by little so that eventually your english improves but at the moment for the exam focus more on the communication section of it right because that's the more technical section for example what kind of uh, uh, communication can we find in a in an office space which is not very healthy right is it grape wine or uh, is it uh, vertical horizontal or um, you know diagonal flow right for example if it's something like that if it's a non healthy gossip uh, you know rumor based uh, atmosphere you're going to choose grape wine right that's the grape wine kind of communication there the answers will not change much right so try going through the business communication aspect right now focus a little more on it but also focus on the english aspect for your own personal growth okay go through this book definitely but try going through dictionaries and external sources as well that will definitely help i hope that was helpful sumati yeah okay so now let's move on anyway to the next part which is antonyms so what exactly is an antonym Okay, what's an antonym? Yeah. So Vishnu says that it's notionally opposite in meaning. Very good. An antonym is something is a word which is opposite or contrary in meaning to the other word, right? So it's basically like talking about the opposites. So let's take a look at some of them. So you have ability. The opposite is what inability. Able, unable. Normal, abnormal. Accurate, inaccurate. Bankrupt, solvent. Right. So you have emigrant, immigrant. Explicit, implicit. Exit, entrance. Right. Fact, fiction. Growth, decline or stagnation. Fresh, stale. Flexible, rigid. Right. Let's take a look at few more. Haste, slowness, hope, despair, humble, proud, idle, busy, import, export, inferior, superior, loud, quiet or soft, meager, plentiful, narrow, broad, native, foreign, omission, addition or inclusion, oral, written, original, duplicate, outward, inward, peace, war. quick slow right so try going through these words go also through the thesaurus the dictionaries you know any external sources that you can find because no learning is bad right learning will always help any resources that you get try using them so now let's take a look at the fourth category that is homophones so what is a homophone So what exactly is a homophone? So basically it refers to two words that sound the same but have very different meanings, right? For example, you have words like this, access excess, right? Access basically means to approach and excess means more than. For example, if you see here, the workers could access the manager freely, that means they could freely approach the manager. excess on the other hand refers to something that is more than so the production is in far is far in excess to the target so the production is in excess it's more than the target so similarly your words like advice in advice 
right? So advice is a noun that ends with an S sound. Advice. Anyone can offer advice. Advise, on the other hand, is a verb. And the N sound is a Z. Sounds like a Z. My father advised me to work hard. Then you have eight in eight. Eight means like it's to eat, right? It's the past tense of to eat. I ate my meal. I ate an entire pizza. But eight here, E-I-G-H-T, is a noun. It's a number, right? After seven, but it comes before nine, like eight o'clock, 8 p.m., right? Then you have words like bear in bear. B-A-R-E is an adjective. B-E-A-R is a noun. So these words, again, you have to keep in mind. For example, cell and cell. Cell is a noun, like a prison cell, or the cells in the human body in an animal's a uh, plant cell, for example. To sell is a verb. Basically, it's to sell something. To exchange a product, right? In exchange for money. Right? Like we would like to sell our car. I would like to sell my bike. Then, there is another category called a homonym. What's a homonym? So a homonym basically is a single word with one spelling, but it has more than one meaning. For example, address and address, right? Like I can give you the address of a good attorney. The letter was addressed to me. Band and band. The band was playing old Beatles songs, but she always ties her hair up, you know, back in a band. Bat and bat. I'm afraid of bats, like the animal, right? Like the bird, actually. Oh, sorry, the mammal. What am I saying? The mammal bat, right? And it's his first time at bat in the major leagues. So he's batting. This is related to cricket. Then you have match and match, right? If you suspect a gas leak, then do not strike a match, like the electricity or the fire match, right? Here, her Fingerprints match those at the scene of the crime. So this refers to something that is matching, right? Whether my fingerprints match. You could also have a cricket match, a tennis match, a football match, right? So it depends on the context used. Mean and mean. So what does the sentence mean? He needed to find a mean between frankness and rudeness. This boy is mean. This girl is mean to me, right? It has different meanings. Again, right and right. I'm sure I'm right. Take a right turn. The next aspect is a single group for groups of words. It's basically a one word substitution. Again, this will depend on how good your uh, you know, English vocabulary is. This comes with practice, with constant reading and the zeal to learn more. If you have to replace this entire sentence, right? Greed, which is the inordinate desire to gain and hold wealth. One word that could substitute for it would be avarice. That means greed. That which cannot be taken by force is impregnable. Like the fort was impregnable. That means nobody could take that fort by force. Okay. Then one who learns a subject as a hobby is an amateur. Not a professional, does not earn money from it, just takes up a subject as a hobby. To that, uh, sorry, that which can be easily broken is fragile. Okay, it can be broken easily. To show indecision or to sway to and fro in a decision, that is to vacillate, okay, to move from one place to another, to sway. Unpleasant sound is a euphony. Could be noise, euphony. Deliberate killing of a whole community or a race is called genocide. A place where an aeroplane is housed is called a hangar. Similarly, a person who is dissatisfied and is inclined to rebel is somebody who is malcontent. Not content. He is or she is dissatisfied. 
to pretend to be sick in order to avoid work is a manager. Okay. Then one of a race or tribe who has no fixed location and wanders from place to place is a nomad. The study or collection of coins, banknotes, and medals is called numismatics. A blood feud started by murder seeking revenge is a vendetta. Then, a person who deliberately damages private or public property is a vandal. Let's now come to words that are frequently misspelled. Right? So, some of the common words that are incorrectly spelled, right, are absence. So, a lot of people write it this way. Accommodate has two C's and two M's. Right? Some people just forget to write the other M. Achieve, I before E. But they write sometimes E before I, right? So, that is incorrect here. Calendar has an A. Some people write with an E, right? That is wrong. It's liaison. Some people forget to write an I here between the A and the S. Receipt is E-I, but some people write I-E, right? And tomorrow has a single N and a double R. Okay, so be very careful with spellings and pronunciations as well. Okay, so now let's move on to the next part, which is abbreviations. So what exactly is an abbreviation? Uh, you may write your answers in the chat box again so I can see that. Yeah, what's an abbreviation? Yeah, what's an abbreviation? Basically, it's a short form, right? So let's see. MA, for example, stands for Master of Arts. Post Meridium is PM. AM would be Anti Meridium, right? Before noon, afternoon, AM, PM. BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Okay, sometimes, you know, it's used also uh, at the end of a word. For example, like prof, like professor, cat, captain, major is major, gen is general. And you can also see sometimes that they use a full stop. Then acronyms could also include, uh, you know, words like UNICEF, which is the United Nations International Children Emergency Fund. Then FICCI stands for the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Then we can see it also for Mr. like MR, Dr. DR, and scientific terms like KG, pound, right? That's written as LB, meter, and that's ampere. Feet, FT, yard is YD, and miles per hour is NPH. Chemical symbols like CA, that's calcium, H is hydrogen, NaCl is sodium chloride, H2O is water. Okay? Sometimes we can also uh, have plurals in abbreviation. For example, the general rule is to make an abbreviation plural. It's to repeat the same alphabet such as P for page. And PP is pages. MA is MPs with an S, captains with an S. Right? However, there are some exceptions. For example, if you're writing Mr., right, MR, which is Messrs., Right? In plural, it cannot be MRS. Right? That becomes Mrs. Again, you have to keep in mind all of these little aspects. Okay? The next important part is an idiom and a phrase. So there is no shortcut to it. For idioms and phrases, you have to just go through the list and memorize it. Basically, idioms and phrases stand for words which are used in a certain context, right, to mean something else. For example, to beat back means the firemen were beaten back by the flames, means that the firemen had to, uh, you know, they were forced to retreat. They were made to retreat because of the flames, right? So this is important. Try and memorize idioms and phrasal words, 
right? Like boil down to means amount to. Cast aside is to reject or to throw aside. Cut off with a shilling means to give somebody a mere trifle in the will. Gloss over is to ignore. For example, even if you are an important person, your faults cannot be glossed over. It cannot be overlooked. It cannot be ignored. So let's go through some of the idiomatic expressions. We can't do all because this definitely takes time, practice, and a lot of effort. Okay, so we'll try and do as many as we can though before moving on to the next part. So for example, if somebody says to, um, you know, it's like a give and take policy. What is a give and take policy? It's basically a policy of mutual, mutual concessions. Okay. So if I say that I have a bone to pick with someone, basically it means to have a difference with that person and that has not been fully expressed. Another one is, um, you know, to keep the wolf from the door. That means to keep away extreme poverty and hunger. So lakhs of people in India still have to fight daily to keep the wolf from the door. That means a lot of people in India are very hungry. They're extremely poor, right? And they have to really fight a lot to be able to eat, to sustain themselves. What do you mean by to make amends? It means to compensate or to make up for a wrongdoing. Okay, by being polite today, he has made amends for his past insolence. When you say to make much ado about nothing, it basically means to make a great fuss about a trifle. Crying over the loss of 10 rupees is really making much ado about nothing. To rise to the occasion means to show daring and imagination, which fits a particular occasion. A flood threatened to burst the reservoir, but the villagers rose to the occasion and did not relax till they had made all secure. To set one's own house in order basically means to arrange one's affairs harmoniously. Okay. So similarly, you have a lot of these idiomatic expressions here. For example, to bear the brunt of means to bear the main force or shock of. To blunt the edge of is to make something less effective. For example, time blunts the edge of grief. So my suggestion is to go through these um, idiomatic phrases and expressions because this will definitely help. Okay, so the next part that we can work on. So you have a lot of these actually. Go through all of these is proverbs. So what is a proverb? Here we see proverbs. So proverbs generally contain some truths as well as urban truths as well as universal truths. Okay, for example, we say better le uh, never than late, uh, better late than never, right? Better late than never. Again, there is no fool like an old fool. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush. Birds of a feather flock together. This means that the people of like character, right? They come together generally. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. One man's meat is another man's poison. Out of the frying pan into the fire. It never rains but pours. The last straw breaks the camel's back. Right? All of these, for example, are proverbs. So the next aspect that we are going to take a look at is this foreign words and phrases. So what exactly are foreign words and phrases? 
they are generally used in the english language now but they have been borrowed from another language right usually latin or greek but also from french german you know english is a very rich language because it's borrowed words from a lot of foreign languages so now let's take a look at some of them again the list here is quite extensive it's quite big but we'll take a look at the more commonly used ones right for example ab initio refers to from the beginning ab origin means from the origin it comes from the latin terms right addenda again comes from latin which means a list of additions ad valorem means according to the value ad hoc is a body elected or appointed for a particular word alma mater is a school or a college that one has attended a la carte basically comes from the french word which means according to the card or the menu list a la mode again is french which means according to fashion alter ego is the other self okay similarly a priori or a priori comes from the latin which means presumptive from cause to effect a propos again comes from latin which means with reference to okay au revoir means bye bye in french until we meet again avo propos means preliminary matter or preface avant garde is again a french word which is new unusual or experimental bona fide comes from the latin which means genuine or sincere okay bon voyage a bon voyage comes from the french word which means have a good journey right similarly you have a lot of other words which come from french greek latin like you have de facto which is actual or in fact and de jure which is right uh, you know by right from the law by right the novo is a new again then elite is a select group or class errata for example is a list of errors right entourage is basically a group uh, a company a dignitary like the prime minister or the president eureka comes from greek uh, you know which means i have found it ex officio means by the virtue of his office status or position okay similarly you have a lot of words here i would suggest going through this as well okay so one thing that we didn't cover earlier during abbreviations was things to remember while using abbreviations do not use an abbreviation if it can be avoided easily okay in an abbreviation use full stops and capital letters in a conventional way and don't forget to punctuate the rest of the sentence normally so that's uh, pretty much it actually when it comes to uh you know and en uh, enriching your vocabulary now very quickly this is one of the last parts actually what is comprehension of passage and the art of summarizing so what are the strategies one uses for comprehension passages when you have a passage given how do you generally go um you know how do you generally read it and answer the questions how do you do it for a written comprehension Can you tell me in the chat box, like what strategies do you use personally? Yeah. So, do you first read the passage as fast as possible, and then get thoroughly involved with the passage to understand it? What you can also do. is underline important lines or parts of the passage and then answer the questions okay what it does is it helps you understand the main idea and the tone of the passage or the mood of the author as well then if there is a very complex line try to translate it in your own words right so you understand the main idea the concept is very clear in your mind 
Apart from this, try to understand any unfamiliar words that you might have. In context, you will get it generally. Okay? Then, do not assume anything. Because it's only a passage that you have to base your answers on, right? You have to look at the passage and then answer. So, it should not be based on your personal belief. Always refer, uh, you know, to the paragraph or the passage again whenever you're in doubt. Okay? The first thing to do generally while reading a comprehension passage is to read the passage carefully, read the questions, go back to the passage, and then try and do it. So the way I generally answer comprehension passages is by reading the title of the comprehension passage. Then I read the questions because it helps me figure out, you know, what the passage could be about. Right? Try this. This generally works. Read the title of the passage. Read the questions. Go back to the passage. Read the passage thoroughly. Read the questions. Go back again. Check your answers. While you read the passage. Okay? So try doing this. The things to remember is, uh, you know, find the central idea and the passage, focus on the details, use the logical structure in order to figure it out, and figure out the tone of the passage. Okay, so there are a lot of factors and skills which are generally required, right? Which is why I'm really focusing on using external sources apart from the CS books as well. So look at logical, it depends on your logical ability to understand as well. Your fluency in a language, this comes with practice. In inference power, again, this comes with a lot of practice when it comes to reading. Your analytical ability, reasoning ability. Okay, you have to use all of these skills while working on a comprehension passage. Sentence construction, cohesion, reading speed, vocabulary power, working memory and attention, again, play very important, uh, you know, plays a very important role in understanding a passage okay so try this you have a lot of um basically um you know like you have these sample questions with the answers provided in this uh, little booklet try going through that so we have actually pretty much covered almost everything except for the last chapter right so the last chapter basically is about sorry, is about the common business terminologies, right? We hadn't done this so far, so we can't do the whole thing again. You have to go through it, analyze every definition, see what it means, but we'll do a few common business terms, right? Terminologies that we use. So the 10 basic but most important terms or words in business English is management, right? Management is basically those people who are in charge of running a business. Then you have business itself, right? That's the activity of providing goods and services involving financial and commercial industrial aspects. Then we come to the concept of marketing. This refers to the commercial processes involved in promoting and selling and distributing a product or service. Profit is basically the amount of money that is left over after expenses are taken out. Telecommuting is something that we are doing now. Right? It involves working at home, usually on a computer. Downsizing is a planned reduction in the number of employees needed in a firm in order to reduce costs and make the business more efficient. Outsourcing refers to contracting out selected functions or activities of an organization to other organizations that can do the work more cost efficiently. R&D stands for research and development. Basically, business or government activity that is purposely designed to stimulate invention and innovation. Headquarters, it's usually referred to in the plural form. It's the office that serves as the administrative center of an enterprise. And a market is the world of commercial activity where goods and services are bought and sold. You have a list here. Okay, for example, um, you know, what is an act of God? Right, an act of God generally is a term usually used in business, okay, in insurance generally, to denote risks and dangers arising out of natural causes that are beyond human control. 
what is an action? An action is also a case or a lawsuit. So all of this will come by reading and with more practice. Okay, so let me just ask you a few questions. You may already know the answers to this, right? So what is an asset? You could just maybe quickly type in here in the chat box. This is the last concept that we'll be covering today. What is an asset? We use this word a lot in business terminologies, right? So what is an asset? Basically, anything to which money value can be attached. It could be cash, it could be physical, you know, such as land or building. It could be tangi tangible or intangible, right? Tangible like patents or trademarks. It could be intangible such as goodwill. Uh, for example, who is an attorney? Who is an attorney? A lawyer? A person legally appointed or empowered to act on behalf of another? during the latter's li lifetime for a specific or general purpose, right? Then what is a balance sheet? Good. So what is a balance sheet? Generally, it's the financial statement, you know, prepared at the end of a period, generally the financial year, and it shows you the assets, liabilities, and net worth of the organization, right? So similarly, I would suggest going through this entire list, you know, while focusing on important words like contract, cover note, credit, debit, you know, words like this, which are most commonly used, right? This will help. Okay, so uh, do prepare well. So we'll stop with this for today, okay? And uh, you have the other subjects for CSET. Okay, that's logical reasoning, uh, legal aptitude, current affairs that the other teachers will be covering as well during this week. So I would suggest logging into our YouTube site, right, and take part in these live revision classes that are going on. Apart from this, a uh, tip is to keep practicing your English and business communication. Don't stop, you know, just for the CSCET preparation. Keep practicing every single day, at least for just 10, 20 minutes, and that will really help improve your English uh, and business communication skills throughout, right? You can use this for your entire lifetime. It doesn't stop with this exam preparation, okay? So I hope this was helpful. Yeah, and if you have any more doubts or questions, you could leave it in the comments. I'll see how I can get back to you. Um, if not, please feel free to log into my website for more MCQ practice. You know, and uh, yeah, so just all the very best and study well. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe and uh, revise well. All the best for your exam. Take care. Good night. Bye bye.